I think I told you this via DM, but my husband and I have been experimenting with your diet style. I love it. With a little bit of flexibility, I would say. And it has brought up some questions. So selfishly, I wanted you on the podcast today because I want to make sure I'm doing it the right way. Okay. Um, But I also just want to learn more from you. So let's start with why do you eat this way? Like what's the backstory? So I think that just from the outset, I'll give a little bit of framework of the way that I think about diet. So I'm a doctor. And nutrition is not taught in medical school. Nutrition is not thought about in any sort of Western medicine. So I'm an MD. I did medical school at the University of Arizona. I went to residency at the University of Washington. Um, and not once did they talk about any dietary things other than maybe some people have celiac disease and that means you cut out gluten. And But my whole life, I've really been interested in nutrition and, and just how food shapes us as humans. There are a lot of things that shape us as humans and determine whether we're healthy or sick. But food is a huge input. I mean, we're putting kilogram quantities of food in our bodies every day. We're putting thousands of grams of food in our body. And that is full of all sorts of nutrients. It's full of toxins. It's full of anti-nutrients. And so what is the formula? I think it's an interesting question to ask off the beginning, off the top. Like, what's the formula that helps people thrive the best? Is there a program for Homo sapiens? Because we're all one species called Homo sapiens. And if you look at other species in the animal kingdom, there generally are species appropriate diets. Now, between individuals, there's going to be some variation, but it's an interesting question for me to ask, like how much variation is there between individuals and are there multiple species appropriate diets? And so that's an interesting question for me because it's kind of like if you go to the gas station and you have a nice car and it says this car only takes 91 octane, why would you put in the crappy gas? Mm -hmm. You want that car to perform well. And so you get to kind of determine how well your car drives, your car being this metaphor for your body and your experience of life, based on how well we can figure out what humans are supposed to eat. And then, you know, maybe later in the podcast, we'll talk about other things I think about that affect how we live as humans, but starting out with diet. So I think about diet a lot from that perspective. And I think about it personally from the context of my own autoimmune issues, my own issues growing up. So my dad's a doctor, my mom's a nurse. So that means I got over-medicated as a kid Mm -hmm. and I had asthma and eczema. And the way that my parents, God bless them, treated that was a ton of inhalers. So albuterol inhalers and theophylline, which was called Theodore when I was a kid in my applesauce, which is horrible. So theophylline is kind of like caffeine. It just, you know, it, it dilates the bronchioles of the lungs, but there was never any attention to what we were doing for food to treat me as a kid. And then as I went to college, I had horrible eczema flares and there was never any attention. I ended up taking glucocorticoid steroids and they made me feel horrible. And there was never any thought, maybe it's what you're eating, Paul, because I was eating like a normal college kid. And then I went to medical school and I had eczema, which was horrible. And I thought, okay, at this point, I've thought enough about nutrition. I was a physician assistant in cardiology before I went to medical school. And I'd been thinking about nutrition at that point that I, that I started to make changes in my diet. And I was eating kind of organic paleo at the time. And I started to think, what is causing this eczema? Like, clearly I have this autoimmune condition that is affecting my skin and it's probably affecting other things in my body. It's not just my skin. So how do I think about this? Is it milk? Is it pasteurized milk? Is it, is it vegetables? Is it chocolate? Is it meat? Like, what is going on here? And that was kind of what I started thinking about. And it evolved into my residency at the University of Washington when I had just this horrible eczema flare. At the time I was eating tons of mushroom extracts, thinking that they were gonna be great, like reishi and chaga and lion's mane, but like pretty big doses of spoonfuls of these extracts. Mm -hmm. And I think that caused like a massive eczema flare. And I thought, okay, there's something misaligned here. So that was kind of the beginning of my thinking about plants and whether or not all plant foods are ideal or beneficial or fully healthy for all humans. And then you kind of fall down this rabbit hole And not only is no nutrition taught in medical school, but I don't think many doctors or people in the health space are aware that some plant foods, many plant foods contain things that may not be great for all people. Right. Things like we can talk about oxalates, saponins, um, digestive enzyme inhibitors, phytic acid, uh, things that inhibit iodine absorption for the thyroid. And again, I think there's bioindividuality and some people are probably better able to detoxify these things or tolerate them than others. But what's interesting for me as a physician now is thinking about it from the perspective of people who are struggling with issues that aren't getting fixed and whether or not this could be a valuable tool for them to integrate in their lives that they're not seeing elsewhere. Because I've talked to so many people now just in my life when I meet people and heard so many anecdotes, but N of one stories of people who say I had Crohn's disease, which is inflammatory bowel disease, or I had eczema or I had psoriasis, you know, big plaques on their skin, which is different than eczema, but still a skin condition, which is autoimmune. And they went to their doctor and the doctor says, take this biologic 
medication that's a TNF alpha inhibitor or take this steroid or you're going to need a surgery to remove part of your colon because you have ulcerative colitis or whatever. And they said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to change my diet. And for all of these people, the diet completely resolved their issues. Right. And what I think about this and I say to all of them is, did you go back to your doctor and just tell them what happened? Because you need to kind of say to them, what the fuck, man? I would be scared to do that. Right? And it's interesting to me that you're a doctor because I feel like your lifestyle contradicts what a lot of Western doctors would absolutely tell you to do absolutely which is why it's fun to do because yeah. on the flip side of that is my belief that red meat from ruminant animals cows bison lamb um, that meat in general along with organs which we'll talk about in this podcast is probably i'm mean, not probably there's no uh, you know there's no question about it in my mind those are the most essential central food for humans and western medicine says the complete opposite so we mm -hmm. have an impasse and it's interesting to talk about that and negotiate that with people and talk about why Western medicine believes red meat should be limited. Um, why women especially, I think, believe red meat is something that's not good for them. And no one is even really thinking about eating organs. And then going down the rabbit hole of all these other pieces like seed oils, are they good or are they bad? Because if you ask Western medical physicians and you think about the paradigm there, they would say seed oils, which are mostly omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, are good mm -hmm. and I think well that's probably that's a massive difference because I think they're horrible and the flip side of that idea in my mind is that saturated fats from animals things we find in tallow or butter things like stearic acid and 18 carbon saturated fat are healthy so we have this really interesting kind of contrast where I'm saying I think most of what we've been told about nutrition is dead wrong yeah and I really want to speak about the piece you mentioned about women. Yeah. Because I do think there's this massive misconception that eating a lot of meat is a masculine thing to do. Yes. And it could raise testosterone in a negative way or it could cause acne. Lots of questions yeah, there. Yeah. You were vegan for a while. Seven months of a raw vegan. Okay. I'm really cu curious how you felt during that time, what your blood work looked like, and then how it changed when you switched to animal-based. So I was... 25 pounds of muscle lighter so i was extremely skinny. and you're super lean right now i'm super lean i weigh 170 pounds now and i'm moderately muscular i'm not a bodybuilder at golds but i'm moderately muscular but when i was on a vegan diet i lost a lot of lean muscle mass i was very skinny what were you eating i was eating so i would go to i would go to the equivalent of whole foods i was in flagstaff arizona at the time and buy two heads of kale per day so if I was going to the grocery store for three days, I would buy six heads of kale. And the people at the checkout would go, what is this for? <laughs> it's for my two kale smoothies a day. It's like an animal feed type of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's for my 60 rabbits or me. And I would, I would have two kale smoothies. I don't know. Like I was eating raw fruits and vegetables and nuts and sprouted nuts. And um, we would not be able to do this podcast without me having massive anxiety when I was a vegan about my gas. Because I would just be farting so much and had massive bloating and... You know, just lots of GI issues with yeah. that many vegetables and, and plants. And I was running at the time. And so I was never a very fast distance runner. But I, my performance running suffered. Flagstaff is home to some of the best distance runners in the world. And I would never keep up with them. But I would try to go on their slow training runs. And it was horrible because in the middle of the run, I'd have to stop and poop or just have issues or be hungry or be tired. And I think sleep started to suffer. My eczema didn't get better. But... It wasn't any of those things that, that kind of shook me out of that perspective. It was a girl. So I was friends with a guy who was trying to get me to go on some dates because I wasn't going on any dates. And he set me up with this nurse and had us all over to his house. And I met this girl, this woman. And after the night, I asked him like, hey, does she want to go out again? And he said, no, she doesn't want to go out with you. She says, you're too skinny. And I think it was, if you, I see pictures of myself and it, I really did look very, very skinny. It was, it was too skinny. Mm. And so I had a little body dysmorphia of my own yeah. at the time thinking I need to be skinnier for running or just for this. And it, it kind of shook me out of that, that sort of evolutionary urge, like you must procreate. Like if you keep doing this vegan diet, bro, your genes are never getting passed to the next generation. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, this makes sense. And also I, I think at that point, I just heard someone talking about this book of life, these genetics that we have as humans and how humans have eaten meat through our whole evolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, Homo sapiens, the species, our species is 500,000 years old, according to most anthropologists, preceded by Homo habilis and Homo erectus going back 1.8 million years. And if we look at that time period, there's a lot of interesting anthropology evidence that one of the things that contributed to us becoming human, in air quotes, was the inclusion of meat in our diets. There are mass graves of animals that begin 1.8, 2 million years ago. There's all sorts of evidence that humans became 
proficient hunters at that time. And then if you look at that, that correlates perfectly with the rapid growth of the human brain from 600 cc's the size of like a grapefruit to something the size of what we have today. Mm. And that's 600 cc's to 1500 cc's. So the size of the human brain almost triples in 2 million years. Whereas before that, in our primate evolution from chimps and bonobos, the size of our brains is essentially constant for 30, 40 million years. So what happened there? There's a lot of interesting theories about that, but somehow we became human. There's lots of questions around that. The East African Rift Valley, I've actually visited it in Tanzania, it's presumed that some group of chimps or bonobos came down out of the trees and became hominids, Australopithecus. But I think that we began hunting more and the unique nutrients in meat and organs corroborate that story. What is the biggest issue with plants and plant-based diets? Like why, why are they causing autoimmune issues? Why is it resulting in lower body or muscle mass? What do you think? There's two issues. So there's lack of bioavailable nutrients, which we can dig, dig into. And there are toxins, anti-nutrients in the plants. And if you think about it from the perspective of a plant, it makes sense. Um, a, an animal can run away from you. If you're, have you ever hunted? No. You should. Do I look like I've hunted? No, but <laughs> I don't want to assume. Maybe you have. Like, I, would, I wouldn't mind trying, honestly. Yeah. After listening to you and Joe Rogan, I would be interested to try. It's a very spiritual experience, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's valuable for humans to know where their meat come from, comes from, regardless of their ethics. Because when you eat meat that you've hunted, you sort of understand that this that animals, if we believe, and I think the science would support this, are the most nutrient-rich sources of, of nourishment for humans on the planet, then it, it, create, it evokes like massive amounts of gratitude when you think, okay, in order for something to live, something else must die. This is the way of life. This animal is going to die no matter what. And if it nourishes me, I can do the most good in the world. But that's a separate ethical conversation. But when you're hunting, you know, the animal can run away from you. And if a plant is there, the plant can't run anywhere. So this coevolution between animals and insects and other things that feed on, on plants for 400 million years, so we're talking a huge time scale, has been this constant warfare where animals uh, respond to plant defense chemicals by developing detoxification systems. But plants then evolve new defense chemicals or they evolve defense chemicals that turn toxic when the animal tries to detoxify them. So there's, there's clearly this system or this saga of plant animal chemical warfare for hundreds of millions of years. And these chemicals are never talked about, and they're potentially problematic for us today. And yet, we sort of eat plants without any regard to these. There's a few plants that we think about that people may know as toxic. I don't know. When I grew up in Virginia around Christmas, there were always these really beautiful red leaves, these poinsettia, poinsettia leaves. And they're very toxic. They would always say, kid, don't eat that. That's toxic. Well, yeah. And it's because of toxins in the plant leaves. People have died from eating rhubarb leaves. We see rhubarb stems in the grocery store for rhubarb pie, but the leaves have so many oxalates that people have died mm. from eating these. And people have died from eating sorrel, which is a green found in the wilderness, also high levels of oxalates. And there's tons of toxic plants if you're out in nature, you know, like you're not just gonna let your child roam around eating plants because, or, or mushrooms, they're very toxic. But for some reason we've said, okay, these plant leaves that we're putting in the grocery store, these are, these are totally fine for you and they don't have any toxins, which is a complete myth. Now, we can talk more about specific plants and which are worse or better, but um, can humans deal with those toxins? Could they accumulate in some people? Are they causing issues for people? And the reason they cause issues can be a lot of things. It can be, they can prevent the absorption of nutrients and we can drill down on any of this or they can damage the gut mm. and that's very interesting i mentioned saponins earlier and there are saponins and things like quinoa on the outside what of the is quinoa. A saponin? it's a compound that's essentially like it turns into bubbles it's meant to be there as a plant defense chemical it's bitter it's just a chemical that occurs on the outside of things like quinoa or other grains oats are full of saponins too and every every grain that has saponins has different saponins in mm. oats they're called the avancocides a people are upset about the oatmeal i know we got to talk about it people are angry about the oatmeal. i'm ready to talk about I've it i've done a couple episodes now where oatmeal's come up and i think people are starting to realize it's not a good option it's not a good option at all not just because of the actual oats but the glyphosate glyphosate pyrethroid pesticides and can you tell everyone what glyphosate is so glyphosate is one of the more commonly used pesticides mm -hmm. um and it, it inhibits the it inhibits some of the enzymatic processes in, involving folate in the human gut and it appears to be damaging for the human gut directly so but people have also heard maybe about 2,4-D or atrazine or pyrethroid there are so many pesticides glyphosate is really the tip of the iceberg it's the one that gets the most um press and it contaminates a lot of things but 
but there are so many pesticides. So you could say, oh, I could get organic oats. But if you, even if you get organic oats, you're still dealing with phytic acid, saponins, and other problematic things in the oats. So we can the saponins are found in quinoa, they're found in oats, and they clearly damage the gut. This has been shown multiple times. So you can see it in cell culture, you can see it in animal and rodent models. They're just not good for the human gut at all. And they're a defense chemical. And they're, and they're not denatured by cooking. So the saponins are very resistant to cooking. So mm -hmm. even if you have a bowl of cooked oatmeal, you have saponins in there. And then you have phytic acid, which is a big molecule that chelates. It means it bites onto minerals. And maybe 30 to 40% of the phytic acid is denatured when you cook oatmeal, but it's still 50 to 60%, 60 to 70% of that phytic acid is still there. So the problem with phytic acid is that if you're eating the oats with anything that you're hoping to get zinc or calcium or magnesium or any of the divalent cations, any of the minerals with a positive two charge, you're not going to absorb that. So in countries where grains make up the majority of the diet, there are pervasive deficiencies in iron, manganese, zinc, copper, selenium, because this phytic acid is a part of these grains and really prevents humans from absorbing it. Right, which I feel like the U.S. is super grain-based. The U.S. is grain-based. Thankfully, it's not as much of a problem in the U.S., but in countries where they have no meat or like essentially mm -hmm. no animal products and they are virtually 100% grain-based, you see massive problems with this. You mentioned reishi mushrooms before, and I'm yeah. kind of stuck on it mentally because I drink this like coffee every day that has reishi in it. Why are you anti-reishi or so anti-mushroom? It was just, so my experience was that when I was taking large doses of these mushroom extracts, I had a massive eczema reaction. It's just mm. a correlation for me. But we know that, so mushrooms are interesting because they're really delicious, right? Um, but, and they certainly, and this is a kind of a theme that I've seen when I'm thinking about these plant foods. There often are compounds in plants that we think of as beneficial. The question that I find intriguing to ask about plant foods or fungi, like mushrooms, is do the benefits outweigh the risks? And can we try and make that calculus as much as possible? And can we observe how we feel with these? Because just because a plant contains a compound that's beneficial doesn't mean it's good for us. And just because it contains a compound that's bad doesn't mean we shouldn't avoid it completely. Mm -hmm. So my experience and what I've heard from other people is that in some individuals, too many mushrooms can trigger the immune system. And that kind of makes sense because they do have these sort of like they have these peptides in them that can look like immune epitopes. So they can look like immune receptors in our human body. And many of the benefits, quote unquote, of the mushrooms are immune, meaning that in laboratory studies, they seem to affect the immune system somehow, like lion's mane. And so the question is, are they overstimulating the immune system? Could they be triggering an autoimmune reaction for some people? In in my experience, they clearly were triggering an autoimmune reaction for me. Very interesting. And the point you bring up about eczema, I can relate to in a lot of ways because I've struggled with acne since I was 21 years old. Right. And lately, actually, the reason I found you was because I've been on a journey to healing my acne and the carnivore diet came up a few times. And I heard you say that acne is just an autoimmune response. Acne is absolutely autoimmune. And it's, I would say, it's, it's not that your face isn't clean enough. Right, <laughs> right, right. I do skincare like three times a day. I feel like I'm a very healthy individual, um, but I'm probably eating closer to like a paleo organic diet currently. Right. I've been trying to incorporate more meat and organs here and there. But um, yeah, I'm really interested to pick your brain about that. And this is exactly what, what I'm thinking about. Someone like you is someone that I hope the content will reach because the idea is, okay, maybe there's some vegetables in your diet or something that you're not aware of that's triggering your autoimmune response. And this is a simple, free, easily accessible way to say, maybe I'll just cut this out for three or four weeks and see how it goes. Right. And then if it doesn't help, you can incorporate it back. But this, I think, is where it makes me excited because it's so empowering for people when they hear this. Mm. Oh, maybe kale is causing my thyroid issues. Maybe spinach is causing my joint pain. Maybe almonds are triggering my acne. And I'm just using examples that are random, not necessarily that almonds trigger acne in everyone, but there, there are foods that can trigger acne in people. And that is an autoimmune thing. Now, if you look at the actual genesis of acne, it's complex. But when I was in medical school, like nobody knew what caused acne. They just said, oh, it's a certain bacteria in the skin. Bullshit. Like just absolute bullshit. Yes, the bacteria is there, but why is the immune system not responding to it properly? And is it possible that there's something else going on there? Yeah. And so medicine wants to treat acne with antibiotics saying, oh, you have acne, you just have an infection of this bacteria in your skin. Well then, why don't people that you're kissing or near get the same infection in the skin? Mm. Clearly it's something about the terrain. This is like perhaps one of the most important concepts of medicine where I think Western medicine goes wrong today is this idea of kind of germ theory versus terrain theory. And that got a lot of press during COVID and 
I don't want people to extrapolate what I'm saying. I'll just explain what I mean by that. I think that so often we fear germs, whether it's MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or a super bug, or viruses, right? <laughs> Everyone knows the virus recently that we were all told to be afraid of, right? And, you know, like, yes, pathogens do affect humans, but as we have learned so um, poignantly recently, the health of the human is probably the most important thing rather than the virulence of the organism. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is this is the terrain idea that when I was in medical school and residency, I certainly came in contact with MRSA or other superbugs, VRE, vancomycin and resistant enterococcus, right? I was working with patients all the time who had MRSA and you're supposed to glove up and do all these things, but you can't, it's everywhere, right? These things are pervasive. So I came in contact, but did I get MRSA? No. And the idea is that if you are a healthy human, your body understands how to deal with these pathogens. This is what our bodies and immune systems have done for hundreds of thousands of years. And so then we started to get, interesting, to get, it, to get into interesting questions around how do we really help the immune system or not piss off the immune system enough? And how do we create metabolic health? And I think that's what we saw during the recent past few years. The people were very susceptible to the recent pandemic stuff when they were metabolically unwell. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the differences were staggering, you know, the, the hospital admissions, the vitamin D levels, all of which are a reflection of metabolic unhealth and prediabetes is essentially the synonym here or frank diabetes, which people didn't know they have. And so imbalance in the human organism leads to susceptibility to pathogens. The pathogens themselves, maybe we don't need to worry about that first and foremost. You shouldn't, I don't think people should be going to Africa and just walking around, around Ebola, but like other organisms, like the propionic bacterium acne, which supposedly causes acne. Like this is not, it's more about the terrain. What is your body doing rather than the bacteria causing it? But it's very convenient for the skincare industry and the people that make face washes to say it's a bacteria that you're just not scrubbing off your skin enough. Highly convenient. Very convenient. I wish I could go back and remove every antibiotic I ever took. Right. Let's hop into a typical what you eat in a day because I have some questions here. Yeah. So today we're recording at about 12.30 mm -hmm. and I, and this is pretty typical for me. I'm not in my home in Costa Rica, but this is about the same. So I usually get up and I have raw milk with some honey. I'll eat some fruit and then I'll take a, a short like interlude. So for people listening who are vegetarian, like I'm vegetarian for the first 45 minutes of the day. <laughs> and then I'll usually eat some meat. It's just kind of how, how I go in terms of hunger. When I'm in Costa Rica, I get up much earlier in the morning, 5.30 or 6, I go surf. And before I surf, I'll do raw milk with honey and maybe a coconut. And then I come back. So you don't drink eating. coffee? I don't drink coffee at all. Okay. Because you've never mentioned it. I've listened to a few of your videos. You've never mentioned coffee. Why don't you drink coffee? Um, okay. So this is a whole thing and your audience is going to hate me. Go for it. Okay. They're going to hate both of us at the end well, of this. Well, they're, they're especially going to hate me <laughs> because we're, we're hopefully we're also going to talk about chocolate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, so... A couple of things about coffee. So what is coffee? Coffee is a seed from a plant. And when I think about plants and the parts of plants that plants don't want you to eat, seeds are probably some of the most highly defended parts of plants. So we're talking nuts, which are seeds, grains. We talked about oats and quinoa, but also wheat, et cetera. People know those grains. Um, beans, like a coffee, quote, bean, which are legumes or black beans or lentils, and then nuts. Right? We talk nuts, grains, seeds, and legumes, right? So those are all seeds because if you plant them in the ground, they grow into a plant. We just call them different things, but they're all seeds. That's a plant baby, meaning that if that gets eaten by an animal and the animal is just says, oh, that tasted great, no problem, and it just gives the animal nutrients, those plants are never going to evolve because those animals are just going to eat the heck out of those seeds. So the, the, the plants will put defense chemicals in the seeds, and the seeds are very highly defended. We talk about saponins. We talk about phytic acid. We've talked a little bit about oxalates. But in the case of coffee, you have defense chemicals in the seeds of that plant, um, like anything else. Caffeine is actually a defense chemical that the plant puts there. Now, interestingly, in the doses we have with caffeine, um, it, it, it reinforces eating the beans because of the way that caffeine affects dopamine in the human brain. And who knows why this is, but it, it, it's a problematic thing for humans, I think mostly from the perspective of sleep. Mm -hmm. So... No one wants to hear this, but the quarter life of caffeine is 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours, meaning that if you drink a cup of coffee at, let's say, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning, a lot of people are waiting now, like 90 minutes after they wake up to drink their coffee. So depending when you wake up, when you drink your first cup of coffee, an average cup of coffee has 150 milligrams to 200 milligrams of caffeine in it. So that 200 milligrams of caffeine, if you drink one single cup of coffee, 
a quarter of that is still in your body affecting the physiology of your brain to initiate sleep, to help you through the sleep stages 12 hours after you drink the coffee. So if you drink coffee at eight or nine and you go to sleep at nine or 10, you still have about a quarter of the coffee, the quarter of the caffeine, excuse me. So 50 milligrams of caffeine in your body at that point. Now, how is that affecting your sleep stages? This is really the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. So doing that every day. Now that's, that's pretty benign. One cup of coffee, quote benign at 9 a.m. I don't do it. I, and I'm saying benign relative to what I'm going to describe next, which is probably a more typical pattern for people, which is a cup of coffee at eight, a cup of coffee at 10, and maybe coffee at one or two. Now at that point, the half-life of caffeine means you've got half of the caffeine is six hours. So if you drink coffee at one or two and you go to sleep at 10 p.m., you've got a lot of caffeine in your body mm. and you've got all of the cumulative caffeine in your body. So say you have three cups of coffee throughout the day, that's 600 milligrams of caffeine and you have them at three different parts throughout the day, you could potentially have 200 milligrams of caffeine still in your body when you go to sleep or 150, which is the equivalent of three fourths of a cup of coffee right before you go to sleep. That's absolutely going to affect your sleep architecture. And when we're talking about sleep architect architecture, it's just important to mention that there are a lot of things that we do that can negatively affect sleep architecture, alcohol, cannabis, um, benzodiazepines, like Ambien, these all affect sleep architecture negatively. Even though they think that, we think that some of them help us get to sleep more quickly, like alcohol or um, smoking marijuana for people to do that, they, they definitely change the architecture. And the architecture of sleep is such that the body wants to do non-REM and REM sleep. And if you do these things, you're going to sleep quicker, but the sleep quality is much worse. So how do you feel about decaf? So decaf usually has much, much less caffeine. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a much better thing for your body, but there are still other problems with coffee and caffeine, Because right? it's still seeds at the it's end of the It's still a seed. There are mold toxins, right? In a lot of coffees, unless it's a wet That's process. That's what's scaring me right now. I feel like everything's moldy. A lot of grains are moldy because you also get mold on oats. So that's right. back to the oats. We didn't even talk about that with oatmeal. Yet another reason not to eat oatmeal. Even it's organic oatmeal, it's going to be moldy. You're talking about fusarium molds. You're talking about all sorts of molds that have I feel like things. shit when I eat oatmeal. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> yeah, well. Because it was huge in the fitness industry for a while, making these protein oats. And I tried it because I wanted to be in with the, with the right. trend. I felt like shit. Well, it's awesome that you were aware enough to notice that. I think the problem for a lot of people is they're doing so many things. They have so many inputs that they may feel poorly and they don't know if it's the fact that they slept late last night. They were up until 2 a.m. scrolling TikTok. They, you know, or they ate a donut yesterday morning. They, there's so many inputs. They can't differentiate signal from noise. I think people are also really checked out of their own bodies. Yes. 100%. Like yeah, they, yeah. they can't really tell because they don't think about what's going in and out. And I think when you become really aware of what you're intaking, you become so much more aware of how you feel on a hour to hour basis in the day. Exactly. And that's super important feedback. That is a huge takeaway for people that mm. to get to the point where you can distinguish, where you can really check in with your body. How are you feeling every hour to hour? That's really powerful because you can think, man, I feel tired. I have a headache. What did I do? Mm -hmm. Was it, oh, I just ate a cinnamon roll or I just ate some lentils or I just ate some meat and that didn't make me feel good. Okay, great. Like whatever it is, like that helps people, I think, distinguish or determine what's going on. Maybe it was the fact that you, you just worked for an hour with the Wi-Fi router right next to your head or who knows what it is, right? right. All kinds of things. But going back to the coffee, yeah, there's mold. Um, so yeah, if, if you wanted to really have the least problematic coffee, you could do a wet processed coffee, which is supposed to limit the mold. That's decaf. And then even with that, you're still going to have acrylamide from the roasting process of the coffee, but nothing is completely benign. I mean, when you, when you toast bread, you get acrylamide. So you're getting acrylamide and then you're getting some of the perhaps anti-nutrients in the coffee, but it's much less problematic if you're doing decaf and you're doing wet process. So it's not moldy and you're thinking about these things, but then who drinks, who does that? Like how many people drink decaf coffee? Me. Why? Um, I react really badly to caffeine. I'm an anxious person as it is, so I really don't need the extra caffeine. But also lately, I've done all of this lab work and I can see mycotoxins in my system. I can see that I have a little bit of mold. Do you like the taste? Yeah. Okay. So you're saying like, why do I drink it at all? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's the taste. And I also think it's like society. You know, I work in this office all day. I see people with their coffees. I kind of want to be a part of it. Right. What would be an alternative? Goat milk? Bone broth. Mm -hmm. People some, some want something warm. I mean, 
LA is kind of a LA is like tricky. It's kind of cold here sometimes yeah. in the morning. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it's the middle of July and it just started getting warm apparently. But I was visiting in March and April. It was freaking cold here. So I'll show you the coffee I drink. It's really weird. It's like this instant Rishi Ganderma coffee that I might just throw in the trash at this point because after listening to you, I'm like, why am I drinking this every day? Or maybe just hold off on it for a few weeks and see if you feel differently. Yeah, hundred percent, and yeah. see how my skin does. I interrupted your wine in a day, so. Let's oh, okay. Continue. But I was just saying, instead of coffee, which I think people will find, hopefully find valuable, like bone broth, okay. warm milk with honey. If you don't want to do honey, just warm milk, warm raw milk. We should talk about raw milk in this podcast. Oh, yeah. So I, I have raw milk with honey, maybe a little fruit, coconut. I usually surf. Then I come back. Mid-morning, I'll eat meat, um, maybe three-fourths of a pound, maybe half a pound in the morning. What grass kind fed, of meat? Grass-fed beef, usually. Um, and I'll do a burger or a steak in the morning. I'll have some organs, usually a little bit of raw liver, half an ounce. We can talk about organs. Um, I'll make some fresh orange juice. I have a juicer, so I'll do some juice. And that's kind of how it goes throughout the day. Those are the foods that I eat throughout the day. I have raw, I'll maybe have a little more raw milk with honey, maybe some raw cheese, fruit in the afternoon for a snack, maybe a, a small burger in the afternoon for like a lunch. And then like five, six o'clock, 6.30, I'll eat dinner, which is probably a pound of meat, grass-fed steak or lamb or something um, with maybe a little bit of dairy, cheese, fruit. Yeah. That's pretty much what I do. Okay. So I have a question for you about the fruit uh -huh. because I have been experimenting and I haven't gone full carnivore, but I went almost there. I was eating mostly meat, meat for breakfast, meat for lunch, meat for dinner and incorporating fruit. One thing I found is that I was having what felt like blood sugar spikes. I kind of had brain fog after the fruit and after the honey, and I kind of felt like it was irritating my skin. Interesting. How do you control, and I'm wondering if it's because maybe I'm just sensitive to sugar or if I'm a woman, I want to hear your take on blood sugar with this diet. You know, for me, it doesn't bother me. And for a lot of people, it doesn't cause an issue. So what I wonder about is, is there something else going on that's kind of making it making you sensitive to that. And I'm mm. trying to troubleshoot it in my mind in real time as we're talking about it. Is it a gut flora issue? You know, if, if, if the honey is flaring up your skin or the fruit is flaring up your skin, I wonder if there's something in your gut that like, yeah. is the sugar feeding something in your gut? I think that for um, someone that doesn't have GI issues, the fruit and the honey can be great. But if you're finding that it's causing issues for you, then maybe there's something else you need to kind of figure out first. And maybe it's not the best thing for you. Maybe there's something better for your carbohydrates in there. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would think gut first in terms of like, is the sugar feeding an overgrowth? Because sometimes we see people with what's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, which is technically when there's a dysbiosis or an imbalance in the amount of gut flora that, or in the populations of gut flora that are in the small intestine. Because you have your stomach, right? Then you have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And those are three parts of the small intestine, which is much larger than the large intestine. Then you have the ileocecal valve, and you have sort of the, the, the large intestine, which is kind of the, the cecum, goes up and around, and then out when you poop. And so the small intestine is where a lot of interesting things happen if it gets the wrong type of bacteria. I think canonically people think of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO as too many bacteria, but when you actually do jejunal aspirates, when you actually go into the jejunum and the small intestine and pull out bacteria, you find that it's not always increased populations, it's the wrong type of bacteria. And that can cause issues for people. That can prevent them from eating fruit and honey or certain types of sugars until they correct that. Interesting. So that would be where I would look in the gut. Now, people will say, well, how do I fix that? And it was funny because I was actually talking to a guy on this trip. It's when I come to the States, it's so interesting because I learned so much from people that have benefit or figured things out. And he had this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I think a lot of people have gut dysbiosis. They're essentially synonymous. We could get really, really specific and maybe create some differentiation, but call it the same thing, gut dysbiosis. And he did it with like probiotics from raw milk. And so I think, oh, that, that's cool. That makes sense evolutionarily, right? It's a simple, elegant solution because I've always found probiotics to be onerous. Which bacteria do I take? Is it spore-based? Is it this one? Is it lactobacillus? Is it does it create serotonin? Does it not? Like what, what am I, like the back, the probiotic space is just dizzying for people. And it's just, it kind of feels like voodoo to me. Like, oh, this probiotic's better than that probiotic. And how do you know which one is really going to correct? And we don't really have the, we don't have the sort of AI big data to know. I mean, there's trillions of bacteria in our gut and 40% of our gut or 50, maybe even 60% of our gut is GI dark matter. Meaning we don't even have, we don't even know what species are there. When we try and sequence the gut, if you do shotgun genomics on the gut, like we don't even know half the things that are in there. Mm. It's like a room and half the people in there, you don't even, there's no identification. They don't have fingerprints. Who, how, do we, how do we deal with that? So I, I love simple, I don't think basic is the right word, but maybe 
throwback evolutionary solutions to this. Like, how did it get there in the first place? Probably because of all the antibiotics you took historically for your acne. Mm. How do you fix it? Who knows? But one solution might be raw dairy, if you can tolerate it. I'm scared of that. Okay. I, I was actually raised on raw dairy because I grew up in the UK uh -huh. and we would have glass bottles delivered to the door every day. Uh -huh. And I think it's a big reason I never get sick. Never. Uh -huh. um, so I have a good immune system, but I'm, I've am i been told over and over again that dairy is going to trigger my acne. I, I would say do an experiment because I don't think it will. Because you know what happens. If I break out. Then you tell me. me, but that's, that's a valuable <laughs> N of one. <laughs> I apologize, but that's an N of one, right? Because, yeah. okay, so here's the difference between raw and pasteurized milk. It's important for people to understand. It's heated. And when you heat the milk, it changes the conformation of many proteins in the milk. There's evidence that it changes the conformation of the whey protein at about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And that appears to lose, that appears to create problems for humans, or it leads to a loss of the benefits because there's multiple epidemiologic studies that show that kids that grow up drinking raw milk, I wish I have, I wish I had, but I didn't have much less, much lower rates of asthma and eczema as adults. So it does something when we're programming the immune system. It's, it's beneficial and hay fever, so allergies. But I have no allergies. So you have no allergies, no eczema, mm -mm. no asthma. This is just an observation, but you have ac acne coming from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I, my, my money is on the fact that the raw dairy will not trigger your acne but perhaps pasteurized dairy would. Right. And it's cool because I've learned a lot from the folks at Raw Farms. Do you know them? Yes, they've sent me a lot of product. I actually have the cream in my fridge. My husband uses it. Amazing, mm -hmm. yeah. We're, the smoothie collab that I'm doing with Erewhon is with the Raw Farms kefir. And so what they were telling me is that regardless of the casein variant, because there's A1 and A2 casein, um, the pasteurization process may make the casein more immunogenic, which makes sense intuitively. You know, Do I have a randomized placebo-controlled trial? No. I wish we could do one. So I think that, at least anecdotally, what I've heard from people, which I think is very valuable, we cannot, we cannot dis discount the power of anecdote and human experience, especially when we're navigating places that no one's ever been. Um, maybe in 50 years, we'll have randomized controlled trials to help guide us on all of these questions. But for right now, there are people suffering that we try to help. Um, anecdotally, people have completely different experiences with raw dairy than they do with pasteurized dairy. And I think that's right. Can and I read you a quote yeah. from the CDC? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to be able to pronounce all of this. Raw milk is milk that has not been pasteurized to kill harmful bacteria. Raw milk can carry harmful germs such as Campylobacter. Campylobacter, yeah. Okay, Cryptosporidium, E. coli, Listeria, Brucella, and Salmonella. These germs can pose serious health risks to you and your family. What's wrong with this statement? Why are they saying this? Remember what we talked about earlier with germ versus terrain? Yeah. And so they say it because it's probably true historically. Mm -hmm. So milk was almost entirely raw. I believe I'm getting this history right. If someone's listening to this and they correct me, I appreciate that. Until the early 1920s when people wanted so much milk that the production volume went up and they were literally milking cows and feeding them the swill, which is the historical reference to the grain byproducts of the alcohol industry. And so historically, milk that's from swill factories and in you know cows are dirty they're pooping and peeing at the same time they're being milked can have all those things but raw milk itself is perhaps one of the least contaminated things on the market if you look at the actual cdc data seafood um, vegetables raw vegetables so many things have much higher rates of contamination than raw milk raw milk is one of the lowest mm. and raw farm is actually really cool they go above and beyond this is not a plug they're not paying me for anything i just think they're really cool when they were telling me about their farm we're gonna go to their farm isn't it just up north a little bit it's in fresno right so they have a special milking barn where they they have like a spa for the cows they wash the cow before they milk them and they test every batch Wow. so according to them like people can consumers can feel very very safe drinking their raw milk Personal experience, I've never had a problem drinking raw milk, and I've had a lot of raw milk in my life. Should we be careful where we're getting it from? Yes, and know who you're giving it to, right? Raw milk for a pregnant mother, just make sure you're, just like, I, I'm not gonna give any medical advice on the podcast, but that's something to be aware of. Like, okay, that's the risk, right? In medical school, they teach us that. Raw cheese and raw milk for a mother, because if a mom gets listeria when she's pregnant, that can be problematic for the baby. So moms have to make their own decisions about that. But I was recently in Greece and I had a hard time getting raw milk. And I was on I was on a on a boat and the people on the boat were telling me it was raw milk and I was thinking this isn't raw milk. And I and I looked at it, it was not raw milk. So we actually found 
uh, a farmer. We went to his farm and I got some raw milk from him. But he said to me, he's like, you can't drink it raw. You have to pass, you have to boil it. And I said, forget that. I'm just going to take a chance. And I was fine, but nobody else on my team was brave enough to drink it. So maybe a farmer on the islands of Zakynthos in Greece is not where you want to get your raw milk from for the first time. That sounds like a good source to me. I probably was, but I don't know how clean the udders were when he was uh, milking yeah. the cow, you know? Yeah. Like, theoretically, raw milk is super safe and good for humans. There are tons of tribes all over the world, the Samburu, the Maasai, who basically live on this stuff. Mm. But know the quality of your sourcing, like anything, right? You wouldn't just eat meat from any farm in the world. So I think that, yes, the CDC, which is kind of this blanket authority trying to help everyone, is telling you be aware. But if you know the sourcing, it's pretty safe. I drink exclusively raw milk in Costa Rica from a farm that does goats, and I've never had a problem. But be aware that there's always risks. And eating anything raw has risks. Hopefully in this podcast, we'll get to eat raw liver. That has risks. Raw meat has risks. People still go to restaurants and eat carpaccio or beef tartare. Right. Raw vegetables have risks. I mean, there's been huge outbreaks of E. coli on spinach. So let's bridge into nut milks. Yeah. I want to talk about that because everyone in LA is obsessed with nut milks. Yeah. Almond, oat. I want to ask you about coconut because I've been drinking coconut and I want to see how you feel because I know you're a big coconut fan. Do you have the coconut milk here? It's native harvest in a green can. Can we look it up? Yeah, we can look it up. You want me to look it up right now? Or maybe some of our... Anna, do you mind looking up native harvest coconut milk? Can we look up the ingredients? I think it's a good one. I want. I check ingredients pretty okay. religiously. I want to see what you think. So I'll comment. I don't... This is something... I, I Hopefully I'll be able to have conversations with people at these meet and greets that we're going to do at Erewhon for the smoothie about why they're afraid of milk. I think a lot of people think that they're lactose intolerant, which is possible. So raw milk contains lactase. It contains the enzyme that breaks down lactose. So if someone is lactose intolerant, you can start with small amounts of raw milk and you can probably get back some ability to digest raw milk, like not pasteurized, because that's going to degrade the enzyme. Or there's kefir. I've heard it pronounced kefir and kefir, but I'm pretty sure it's kefir. <laughs> <laughs> kefir not, sounds way fancy. I know, and so. I've talked to Bulgarians about it. I'm pretty sure it's kefir, but <laughs> tomato, tomato. So if you're sensitive to lactose and you want to start with dairy, you can get raw kefir, which is a fermented milk. There's a difference between kefir and yogurt. Yogurt is fermented at a higher temperature. Kefir is fermented at room temperature. Mm. And kefir is fermented longer than yogurt and has different organisms in it. So raw kefir would also be an interesting thing to think about for your gut, specifically mm. in your case, and think, okay, does raw kefir trigger your acne? Does it help your gut? Could drinking raw kefir to bring it back cir full circle to what we were talking about earlier, would that affect things in your gut? Would it help with tolerance to the sugars eventually? Um, we can circle back to that more in the future. but. The, the nut milks are problematic for a variety of reasons. They're based on seeds, kind of like we're talking about oats. Even raw, you know, even organic oats are problematic. I feel like oat milk would be full of glyphosate, wouldn't it? Uh, oat milk is going to be full of glyphosate unless it's made from organic oats. And okay. then even if it's made from organic oats, you're getting saponins, you're getting all the things we talked about. Almonds contain oxalates. They contain digestive enzyme inhibitors. There's an interesting case series on kids with genitourinary issues, recurrent kidney stones, urinary tract infections, pain with urination. Uh, that had resolution of all those things when they stopped feeding the kids almond milk. Almond is not a good thing for kids, especially almond milk. And then, I don't know what, cashew milk, the same problems. It's all digestive enzyme inhibitors, other things in the nuts. That's just if it's pure water and the nut, presuming the nut is organic. Mm -hmm. And then if, a lot of the milks have seed oils. So uh, Oatly contains canola oil. Yeah. Um, they say, it's like on the label, it says low erucic acid rapeseed oil which is canola oil and other ones have canola or soybean or sunflower or safflower oils some what's the point of them in the milk i think just to make the mouth feel right kind of like, like carrageenan makes it creamy right yes okay they want it to be creamy like a whole milk mm. imagine that evolutionarily humans like the taste of whole milk yeah um and we can talk about evolutionary consistency of drinking milk but um and then a lot of them have the carrageenan that you were mentioning or other things that are thickeners. And we know there's good studies, I believe in both humans and animals, that carrageenan causes gut inflammation. And so yep. a lot of things begin in the gut. We do not want to irritate our gut with a variety of things. Do we have Anna. ingredients on that one? You can read it. So it's organic coconut milk, and then in parentheses we have organic coconut, filtered water, and organic guar gum. Okay, so it's, that's it? Yeah. So guar gum is like, how do we know about this guar gum, right? Yeah. The research on xanthan gum looks pretty benign but i just think really why are we using a gum to like thicken a milk could that be damaging or like irritating your gut yeah and then here's the thing about coconuts so coconuts are a seed and they have defense chemicals too 
And if you're eating the coconut milk, that's going to have more of the problematic things in the coconut that could mess your digestion up. This is my personal experience, but when I was in medical school, I used to make my own coconut milk. What I would do is I would take coconut flakes and put them in warm water and then um, put it in the Vitamix and blend it up and then put it through a cheesecloth. And I found personally that if I drank that coconut milk, my stomach felt funny. I felt kind of nauseous and I felt like that doesn't taste good. But if I fermented it overnight, that something in there, digestive enzyme inhibitor, who knows, was perhaps degraded as many of these plant anti-nutrients are with fermentation and it was easier for me to digest. So if you wanted to make your own coconut milk, I would say ferment it. But I also think you should try regular cow's milk or goat's milk as well. Yeah. But so something like your own fermented coconut milk would probably be the best option if you can't do dairy, but I still think you might be able to do dairy. Should I start with goat's milk, you think? You could, but I think, yeah. And they have a raw goat's milk at Erewhon too. I'm going to stop on the way home. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to try it. it. And goat's milk tastes different than cow's milk. Okay. It's a little goatier. Go funkier maybe? Yeah. And again, you might want to ferment it. See how you do with the lactose. Goat's milk has less lactose than cow's milk, but there's cow's milk, goat's milk, all kinds of things in there that are potentially beneficial. On the topic of fruit, I have some questions for you because yeah. I, you know, while experimenting with this diet, there's a couple things I'm unsure about. For example, tomatoes, avocados, plantains. I know you're very particular with fruits. So yeah. what fruits are okay? Is there a particular season you'll eat them in? How do you go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we think about fruit, just to help people understand the framework, Fruit is the part of a plant that plants want us to eat if we can anthropomorphize. We have them as mostly colorful. They usually change from green to a color when they're ripe. Not always, but often. You know that when you go to the store and you see the, the green bell peppers, those are kind of unripe and they turn to red or orange when they ripen. Like their plants are giving us a signal, this is ripe. Mm -hmm. And we see that in those fruits, many times they w plants will put defense chemicals, which decline as the fruit ripens. The plant is really saying like, wait, 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 it's not ready. Don't eat this. A green banana, different in terms of anti-nutrients and defense chemicals than a yellow banana. It's, and it makes sense, right? It's, a green banana tastes like crap. And this new movement to like eat green bananas and green mangoes makes no sense. Like we can talk about resistant starch and why I think that whole thing is misguided, but like a, a ripe mango tastes a hundred times better than a green mango. Like you can't debate this. So plants are giving us a signal that they want us to eat the fruit. And this is kind of this synergy between animals, humans, and plants. Hey, eat this fruit. A mango seed is obviously too big to eat. And then the seed will end up somewhere else. It'll get moved around or you'll poop the seed out somewhere mm. else. Because plants want to be spread. Plants want to be spread. Or the plant is going to put so many seeds in something like a strawberry that you're not going to be able to destroy all of them in your mouth. Um, this kind of thing, right? And so the idea is that in general, fruit is clearly the least toxic part of plants relative or in contradistinction to things like leaves and stems and seeds and even roots. And those are the parts I, I think people should be most careful of. It's leaves like spinach or kale, roots like white potatoes especially are problematic for people. But even within the family of fruits, there are some fruits from a family called nightshade, which traditionally have immunologic issues for people. So not even all fruits are probably that good for people. And we know this because there are not, some fruits in the wild are just poisonous to humans or po you can't eat everything. And so tomatoes are one of those fruits because they're part of this nightshade family that also includes white potatoes, eggplant, goji berries are actually in the nightshade family. These tend to cause, may cause autoimmune issues for some people. I think they cause autoimmune issues for me. Manifest differently in all people, whether it's acne or for me, my low back just gets kind of tight. And I think, oh, that's weird. Like, why does my low back feel tight now? And this is probably because of lectins something that's been in the nutritional zeitgeist for almost a decade now. They're carbohydrate binding proteins in all foods, but plant lectins appear to be most immunogenic or more highly immunogenic for humans. And white potatoes, things like tomatoes, have more of these lectins, so it can cause issues. Tomatoes, if you remove the skin and the seeds, that gets rid of some lectins. But Isn't that what Italians do? Supposedly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, when you make the tomato sauce. But even with that, personally, my experience, which is just my N of one, is that even a tomato sauce that I made from no skin and no seeds seems to trigger my... Are you Italian? I am. I feel like Saladino is Saladino, very yeah. Italian. Yeah, name. my father's from Sicily. Hmm. Yeah. But you still don't react well to tomatoes. I don't. Interesting. So kind of in my head was like maybe ancestrally someone from that region would be okay with tomatoes. I also have genetics from my mom, German and Irish, and it, it's so complicated at that level. Yeah, I'm from the UK and I feel like tomatoes probably aren't the best for me. Maybe not, but you could in, you know include them or exclude them and see and do that kind of intentionally and follow the signal. 
What specific fruits do you consume? So in Costa Rica, I'm doing a lot of tropical fruit because it's there. And it, and the nice thing about being in Costa Rica is I have a very clear signal to what's in season because I just get my fruit at a farmer's market. Mm. And there, we don't import a lot of fruit in Costa Rica. And when I'm in the grocery store, which I rarely go to, I just go to farmer's markets for my fruit because I like the community aspect of it. You can see, oh, there's blueberries. And I'm thinking, there's no blueberries in Costa Rica. <laughs> like, first of all, they're sprayed with a ton of pesticides. Or, oh, there's grapes. There's no grapes in Costa Rica that I'm aware of. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone listening. But you can tell there's not a lot of apples in Costa Rica. So there are some oranges. Obviously, there's banana, mango, guanabana, which is a special type of fruit in Costa Rica. There's things like mame, uh, whatever, mamoncinos, which are like um, rambutans. Uh, kind of like lychees, all kinds of tropical fruit that people may not have here. So when I'm in the States, I like to eat what's seasonal here. So right now, I'm, it's actually enjoyable to be in Los Angeles because I love cherries. And then peaches are in season and apricots are in season. And, you know, oranges are kind of going out of season and bananas are coming from another part of the world. So I think there's probably some wisdom to eating more locally and eating what's in season. It's just that when you go to a grocery store, it, you need to have a little more awareness of what is from the actual region-ish where you are. I right. Mean, I don't think there's a lot of, I don't know, I imagine in the Central Valley they're growing cherries in California and this kind of thing. But you asked about avocados earlier too. So avocados are a fruit. They're probably fine for most people. Um, what else did you ask about? Avocados, tomatoes. Plantains. Plantains are, you know, they're probably fine. Plantains are a little more fibrous and I think they're better cooked. Obviously, most people are going to cook the plantains anyway. And... If someone has oxalate issues, plantains have a moderate amount of oxalates. It's one mm -hmm. of the fruits that has more oxalates. Kiwis also have a significant amount of oxalates, usually around the seeds that are protecting that are protecting the seeds. And bananas and plantains are interesting because there's lots of little seeds in there that we don't see right. because of the way we've hybridized them. So I'm going to jump to seed oils if let's that's do okay. It. Yeah, um, yeah. I reposted one of your videos the other day mm -hmm. in regards to switching from olive oil, avocado oil to beef tallow yeah. and ghee or butter, which I actually had done already because my naturopath recommended it. Great. And I feel great. I think it tastes great. Me reposting that caused an uproar. Why? Like I got phone calls from my husband's mom, from Fee's mom, <laughs> oh from... God. No, seriously, people freaked out. They're like, oh my God, what do you mean? I thought avocado oil was great. So everyone's freaking out because I just managed to convince my husband's mom to get rid of the margarine. Oh my and she God. switched to olive oil and I was like very happy with that. And now she's like, what do you mean I have to switch again? Can you tell us yeah. why it's so important to switch? What was wrong with that, with cooking an olive oil and avocado oil? So the first thing to say is that avocado and olive are better than seed oils. Mm -hmm. They're from a fruit. So they're fruit oils because, you know, to make olive oil and I was just in Greece. So it's like the, the home of olive oil. You take the olives and you just press them. There's no refining, bleaching, deodorization. There's a great video on YouTube of how they make canola oil, which is rapeseed oil. I've seen it. It's, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. I actually went to a full course on how canola oil is made. What? Oh, yeah. I went to a course okay. and I left being like disgusted and I made like a PSA on my social. Every This was three years ago because it looks like tar. It's I like need, black. I need to go to that course. Oh, yeah. It was fantastic. That's great. Okay. Fantastic. I'm going to go. Yeah. I'm going to go to that course yeah. and like do some do some some. Uh, combat journalism or something <laughs> uh, they're not even gonna know i'm there i'm gonna put a mustache on and like sneak into the canola oil Paul Saladino. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anyone um all the seed oil companies are they're, they're gonna find out on this video that i'm coming to your course and i'm gonna sabotage you <laughs> but so seed oils are from the seed of a plant whether it's a grape seed or a sunflower seed or a soybean which is a seed or a corn grain which is seeds so corn canola sunflower safflower soybean grape seed oils and these oils are much higher in linoleic acid then animal fats and then the fruit oils. So olive oil, avocado oil, better than seed oils. And I'm making that distinction in terms of number one, the way that they're produced and the amount of linoleic acid in the oil. So the problem with the seed oils, just to make sure people understand this, is that the refining, the bleaching, the deodorization creates oxidation in the oils and breaks down the oil and creates a lot of problems with the oil. And there are residues from the production of the oil in the oil. They're an industrial byproduct, essentially, originally used in the late 1800s, early 1900s as machine lubricants. They're not really meant for human consumption, but I think it was Procter and Gamble in 1911 made Crisco and figured out they could sell people this garbage. And we've probably gone down a really negative path since then. So seed oils versus fruit oils versus animal fat. Animal fat has a significantly lower amount of linoleic acid than any of those. 2%, 1% to 2% linoleic acid in animal fats. This is butter, this is ghee, this is tallow, and this is lard from a pig that's not fed corn and soy. So we'll, we'll talk about those, those kind of fats in a moment. But just the, the animal fats from ruminants being tallow, ghee, and butter, much lower linoleic acid, 2%, 1%. 
Olive oil, avocado oil, 10 to 15, up to 20% linoleic acid. Canola oil, 25. Soybean oil, 45. Grapeseed oil, 55% linoleic acid. So if we believe that this 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fat linoleic acid is a problem for humans, then we want to limit it. And that's, I believe that to be true. And that's kind of the paradigm with seed oils. So olive oil and avocado less. But the problem with olive and avocado is that they are, number one, they still have a significant amount of linoleic acid. And number two, they're such a big business that they're often, they're often fake. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's been studies, and I can send you these references. With avocado oil, there's a recent study which is almost an expose. I mean, I think like 60, 70% of the avocado oil was tainted or oxidized. Tainted with what? Tainted with seed oils. Oh, wow. To like fill it up. Mm -hmm. So olive oil has to be in a dark glass bottle and cold pressed and extra virgin. And organic. And organic. And that's still okay to use on a, on a salad, even though I know you're anti-salad. Never like if you heat were gonna, it. If you're going to use it raw, it's okay. Never heat it. Okay, yes. never heat it. Yeah. And what's happening to our bodies when we intake seed oil? So this is interesting. We accumulate it, and we specifically accumulate that linoleic acid. The human body can interconvert saturated fats and monounsaturated fats. So these, a saturated fat is a chain of carbons that with no double bonds between the carbons. There's a molecule on the end. There's a, there's a, there's a few uh, atoms on the end that are not just carbons, but essentially it's a chain of carbons. A monounsaturated fat has one double bond, in the whole chain, and these are 18, 16, 20 carbon chains. And polyunsaturated fats have multiple double bonds. And the omega designation says, where is the first double bond from the end of the molecule? So omega-3 means the first double bond is three carbons from the end. Omega-6 means the first double bond is six carbons from the end. That's just what omega-3 versus omega-6 means. It's nomenclature for fatty acids. So omega-6 fatty acids appear to be very problematic for humans because they have multiple double bonds. Omega-3s are also very unstable. We can talk about that as well. But omega-6 are what are most pervasive in the supply chain, in the food supply, because of these processed oils. So Historically, evolutionarily, for our 500,000 years as homo sapiens, we never had access to large sources of linoleic acid. You could eat a few nuts maybe if you were starving, but there are a lot of work to get them. And do you have any idea? I did some content on this, and it was really interesting for me to do the research how much corn is needed to make five tablespoons of corn oil, which is the equivalent of the average consumer's consumption every every day in the United States. So if you look at seed oils, the average American eats five to seven tablespoons of seed oils a day. So how much corn would someone have to eat to get five tablespoons of corn oil? How many cobs? 60 to 90. Cobs. 60 to 90 cobs in three tablespoons. Five. Three to five, yeah. That's insane. So we'd never get this, right? You would never get that much linoleic acid. You can do the same calculation with soybeans. You can do the same calculation with grape seeds. You can do the same calculation with canola or sunflower. I mean, it's, I think it's two to three. It's like two plus pounds of sunflower seeds. To get five tablespoons of sunflower. Oh my god, I'm so right. triggered right now. <laughs> so, I was already anti seed oils, and now I'm just terrified. We would never have gotten this, but it's you. You know, you go to so we did. Uh, we threw Chipotle under the bus. Maybe three tablespoons of rice. Do these bran businesses oil. just hate you? By the way, I mean, <laughs> I've had people warn me about these things. <laughs> I'm sure they hate me, but interestingly, Chipotle's awakening and perhaps shifting their oil, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, I don't know if that had anything to do with me going in there, but they kicked us out when we were filming, which is always the best part. They're like, you can't film in here. So Chipotle uses rice bran oil and they use about three tablespoons in one serving of a bowl or a burrito. So to get three tablespoons of rice bran oil, you would have to eat something like two pounds of brown rice, three pounds of rice with the bran, three, like two pounds of, what the heck? Like you'd never do that. So are there cobs in that oil? They're cobs? Cobs, like carbohydrates. Oh, no, no, no. It's all, it's all just the okay, oil. Okay. Yeah. But these are, the, the point is it's an evolutionarily inconsistent amount of linoleic acid. When it's 1% in tallow and then it's 55% in grapeseed oil. So if you look at the amount of linoleic acid in human adipose tissue in our fat, it's gone up steadily in the last 50 to 70 years since we've been measuring it. And adipose tissue is really the only reliable indicator because we store linoleic acid. So your original question is why is linoleic acid bad? Because we store it, because it accumulates in our cells and our membranes and in our skin, which is really important for anyone that is in the sun, men or women. Um, and that's a problem because we can't get rid of it easily. If you or anyone listening to this stops eating seed oils today, it takes two years to completely turn over. Based on the best pharmacokinetic studies we have of cell membranes and adipose tissue depots, it takes two years to turn over all that and go back to whatever level you're eating. That was my next question. How long is it in the system? 
essentially two years. This is why I'm so intense. I'm speaking to everyone who hangs out with me. Why I'm so intense about asking what's in the things I order yes. because I know how long it's going to be in my system. We were just out for a birthday dinner for my lovely assistant Fee at a steakhouse and everyone ordered their steaks. And I said, may I ask what this steak is cooked in? And the waiter told me, I was like, is it cooked in butter? That was my request. And he was like, I'll go check with the chef. Amazing. Comes back and tells me that the chef said it's cooked at such a high heat that it has to be cooked in vegetable oil. What? And he's able to finish it off with butter. And I said, first of all, you're wrong. I didn't say that. I said that in my head. I'm too, I'm too polite to say that out loud. I would have brought my own tallow. I would have preferred to have brought my own tallow and said, please make it in this. Do you want to throw the restaurant under the bus? It, what was the name of it? So, it was in Laguna Beach. It began oh. with an S. Great steak. And I know a lot of chefs prefer corn fed meat because it tastes better and they prefer that. vegetable oil. But it's to me, it's just not worth it to have that one meal and have that be in my system for two years. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Greenleaf. I love you guys, but you got to stop cooking in seed oils. You got to cook in tallow and you'll get a million. It would be a fantastic restaurant if they just... Yeah. remove the seed oils. But most places I go to with steaks, they do not cook in seed oil. So the meat on ocean doesn't use seed oils. I've gone all over LA asking this because I go out to dinner sometimes and I don't want to have the things. I went to Boa. I don't think they cook in seed oils on the steaks because I'm not paying $80 for a steak. <laughs> it's marked up like crazy and have them cooked in seed oils. Bug for up. everyone around the country listening, whether they live in Kansas, Florida, LA, what's the best way to avoid seed oils when you eat out or when you're traveling? My friend has an app called Seed Oil Scout. I and have it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. You know about it. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. We actually went and I met the guy that built this. No affiliation, no financial uh, connection with him at all. Just a really great guy. And I went to Hearth, the restaurant in, in New York City that's very forward thinking with regard to this. And yeah, it's really cool. So you can, it's like this kind of, it's like ways. It's like this crowdfunding, crowdsourcing of no seed oils. But you can just ask too, like get, be militant and yeah. do guerrilla warfare in, in restaurants. Because if enough people ask at restaurants, then restaurant owners are going to wise up. And it's not... The, the restaurant doesn't eat, a lot of them will just flame boil or they'll cook the, the steaks on a grill. You don't have to do much. And if they're going to cook it on a flat top, just put tallow on the flat top and you're great. But if the restaurant says they cook in tallow, you have to be careful and say, is it just tallow? Yeah. Because I've been to some places, I went to Smash Burger and I said, what are your, I don't know if it's burgers or fries. It might've been the burgers. Was it the burgers or the fries, Jimmy? I think it was the fries. And they said they cooked the fries in tallow. And it was, I was like, oh, this is great, tallow fries. I'm not a fan of potatoes, but if you wanted to eat fries, fries cooked in tallow would be great. And some amazing person in my audience actually emailed their PR department and said, actually, it's a mixture of canola and tallow. Kind of <sighs> defeats the whole purpose. It does defeat the whole purpose. It, it sounds better if they say tallow for marketing. You know, McDonald's used to cook their French fries in tallow. No. Oh, yes, I did know Until that. Until 1990. Is it because... Like, is tallow more expensive now? It's much more expensive. Okay. It's, it's become kind of like a fancy health food. It's it's becoming a fancy health food, and you have to grow a cow to make tallow, and there's fields of rapeseeds in Canada. So canola is Canadian oil low acid. That's an acronym. There's no canola plant. It's just a Canadian sort of psyop, in my opinion, to get rid of all the rapeseeds, um, which they can grow in Canada. And there's also great evidence that all of these rapeseed rape plants – these can Canadian oil low acid, these canola plants, rape plants are really destroying bee populations in Canada and around the world because of the way that they're spraying them with pesticides and moving the bees out of the areas. So it's a big issue. Like wow. Seed oils are problematic at every, le every level. So I'll just finish the story about seed oils. Linoleic acid accumulates in membranes. And then because it's a polyunsaturated fat, I mean, this is basic organic chemistry that is much less stable. It oxidizes way more quickly and it causes the membranes to have to shift their fluidity. They need to do different things to manage the sort of fluidity of the membrane. And then it just causes membranes to break down more easily and more quickly over time. So acutely, seed oils don't cause inflammation, but in the long term, they cause lots of problems for humans because of this membrane structure. So every cell in your body has a membrane. And your mitochondria, which are little power factories inside the cells, have membranes. And all those membranes get full of linoleic acid. And they're always recycling and turning over, but it takes two years to get out of your system. And so it causes problems at the mitochondrial level, causes problems at the cellular signaling level, causes problems at the membrane level. And I think that there's good evidence now to say that... So we know basically every piece of the equation. We know that if you reduce the amount of linoleic acid in your body, that reduces basically bioactive metabolites of linoleic acid associated with inflammation, things like 4-HNE, they have these fancy names. And we know that if you have more linoleic acid, there's more linoleic acid in your membranes and you get more of these things in your body over time. So it's a real problematic thing. But I'll tell you this because people are going to respond to this. The reason the Western medical system likes seed oils is because they lower LDL. They lower cholesterol. Western doctors are a fan of seed oils. Yes, you can find it on Harvard websites. I mean, we were just, when we were in Greece... 
we were looking at the Harvard Mediterranean Diet Pyramid. On the Harvard Mediterranean Diet Pyramid, in a paper published by Walter Willett, it says, choose vegetable oils, canola. They also say olive, which is great if it's organic and all the things we talked about, but probably not as the only oil. But they say, choose canola oil, choose vegetable oils over animal fats. That's Why on does the this Harvard. divide happen? Like at what point are doctors being told that that's a healthier option? Because we're using the wrong metrics, right? We have the wrong goalpost. If the goalpost is lower your LDL as much as possible, then it looks like canola is better for you. But if you realize that you, there are great studies which show that if you lower the amount of LDL in your body, or at least in circulation with a seed oil, you also increase the amount of oxidized LDL and, and LP little a, which is a marker for cardiovascular disease. LDL is essentially, there's a type of LDL called LP little a, which is highly associated with cardiovascular disease. The whole lipid conversation is very complex and nuanced. Yeah. Um, but just suffice it to say at a high level, we can go down this rabbit hole if you want, or people can follow my content to find more about it, that lowering LDL, I think is clearly not the best metric for cardiovascular disease. You have super high LDL, correct? It used to be very high. It's actually not that high anymore. It's oh. funny, LDL fluctuates a lot. So the last time I checked my LDL, it was 160. I think I've even had one recently, there's 139 milligrams per deciliter, which is above the reference range. If I went to a doctor and we're gonna do this actually, um, hopefully we can find a doctor that's willing to have this conversation with me. Most might recommend that I go on a statin. I'm 46 years old. I have a father with a history of heart disease, um, but, what I think most doctors are missing is that my HDL is high, my triglycerides are low, my fasting insulin is low. So this myopic focus on LDL to me is so misguided. It's such a, it's a very poor predictor of cardiovascular disease. And again, I don't want to get too technical in the LDL discussion, but I think the evidence that LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium of human arteries is, is not there. It's just right. bullshit. And people will say ApoB. ApoB is just a fancy name for LDL and a few other particles in our circulation that are lipoproteins that contain the ApoB lipoprotein, chylomicrons, VLDL. But essentially, ApoB is talking about LDL as well. So I don't worry about an LDL in someone that is metabolically healthy, okay. meaning a fasting insulin less than five micro IU per ml. How would you measure that? A continuous glucose monitor? Oh, or? no, you can just get a blood test. Oh, Maybe okay. $25 for a fasting insulin check. So just to summarize everything you said, Everything. We sh not everything. <laughs> Just in terms of the cholesterol for everyone listening, we shouldn't be worried about high LDL because I think a lot of people, when you say you're eating an animal-based diet or you eat a lot of eggs or something, that's the first response is what about your cholesterol? It's, it's a, and it's a very interesting question and it's predicated on this notion that LDL is directly causing atherosclerosis and I think that's false. Okay. And I think that there are other nuanced things to be aware of. Your metabolic health, get a fasting insulin, all these kind of things. So I don't worry about LDL in someone that's metabolically healthy. And I don't think a food that might raise your LDL 20% is problematic if it also improves your metabolic health and your insulin sensitivity. Does that make sense? Yes. So to, I think I, I'll just say this for people. So my point is really clear. My position is clear. I don't worry about people eating red meat. Even if it's a diabetic, I don't worry about them eating red meat because the nutrients in the red meat and the red meat is not making you more insulin resistant. The red meat is not worsening your diabetes. Right. The red meat is only helping your diabetes. And if you get rid of the seed oils, which I think are the major cause of your diabetes and maybe other garbage you're eating that are damaging your gut and increasing cortisol, I think you're putting yourself in the right direction. Let's talk about meat. Yeah. I mean, obviously we've been alluding to meet this whole conversation, but I feel like we need to dive in. Mm -hmm. My podcast is a majority women listening, 95% women. Uh -huh. I want to speak to them. For women who are afraid to eat too much meat, to eat red meat, to eat animal-based, what would you say? That the main side effects of eating red meat are a healthy libido, good fertility, good skin, normalizing periods and menstrual irregularities, and probably more muscle mass, which leads to weight loss. So, wow, slam dunk. <laughs> I mean, I think that like, I think that I, I mean, you can help me with this too. And when I talk to women on podcasts or in my life, I'm always curious, why do you think it is that it's hard for women to eat meat? Is it just, are women told that it's masculine or that it's gonna make you muscular and, and not attractive to men? Or like, what is that? Or I can actually tell you an experience I've had because obviously I've I've had acne for such a long time. I've spoken to so many doctors. The first question is, how much meat do you eat and do you work out too much? So I've been told pretty much over and over again that I, I live in a too masculine, I, I'm living too masculine, in a masculine way. Do you know what I mean? So I do think through media, through social media, through doctors, 
we're being told over and over again that it is a masculine way to live life. I have kind of gone against the grain with that, I would say, because I feel my best. And I think I've been lucky. I don't know how much you know about my story, but I lost 90 pounds in 2017. And just through experimenting with diet and trying different things, I really figured out that I felt my best and looked my best when I ate high fat, a lot of protein and low carb. That's amazing. And my husband kind of does the same thing. And luckily we have each other. Um, but we talk a lot about hormonal health on this podcast because I really do think there's an epidemic right now because women have been on birth control for years. They've been on antibiotics. They're on Accutane. They're on spironolactone. Oh so there's there's a ton of issues happening in the world with Plastics, women. Plastics, PFAs. There's a lot of endocrine disruptors everywhere. Yeah, it's a big deal. So you would say that this diet that you live by would benefit a woman just as much? Absolutely. So with no difference? Well, I mean, differences maybe in the macros, differences in, in terms of how many carbs, how many how much fat, how much protein. Uh, you know, maybe women are not going to eat as much meat as a man. And it's probably, usually it's based, I would say, on lean body mass. <clears throat> so, you know, what I've given people as just a basic tool is one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day is a ballpark. So I'm 170 pounds. I usually probably will get about 170 to 200 grams of protein a day. So if a woman weighs 100 pounds, 100 grams of protein a day from, I would say, good sources of protein. And, and I'm couching that in the understanding that animal protein is much more bioavailable than plant protein. Now, if you want to get all of your protein from plants, great. I just think that if you're getting all your protein from plants, you're either going to have to use a very highly processed pea protein or hemp protein, which is going to have all sorts of additives and derivatives. And, and it's just not a great way to get your protein, or you're going to eat so many rice and beans that you're going to have GI issues. So I think that it, it just getting your protein as a man or a woman from an animal source makes so much sense because then you get all these other nutrients that are simply not found in plant foods with the protein. I mean, where does someone get the creatine that helps your brain and your muscles? I mean, creatine is the most single studied performance enhancing thing. And even if a woman is just is is doing Pilates or yoga, creatine is going to benefit you. You need creatine to think clearly. You need creatine in your job no matter what you do. You need creatine to raise your kids. Creatine makes vegetarians smarter when we give it to them in studies. So creatine is critical. That's just one nutrient. Choline is critical for both, you know, male and female brain development. For a woman to grow a child, the child's body needs choline. Where do you get it if you're only eating vegetables? You don't. Mm. A small amount of broccoli, but nowhere near what you can get from egg yolks and liver and meat. That's just the beginning. What about taurine? I just saw an article about the really clear association between taurine and that has bull in it right that's a that's clearly an animal-based nutrient like carnitine it has car this latin prefix that tells you it's from meat um like taurine is associated with healthy aging and there's the human body can make taurine but it doesn't make enough and it's only found in animal products then there's carnitine there's you know there's answerine there's vitamin k2 there's vitamin b12 the list is so long that I think that there's a clear distinction between all the benefits of one versus another. And I think that for women, they shouldn't fear the animal protein. Now, ethics matters. Where are you sourcing it from? Thankfully, in L.A., there's lots of places or around the world. There's places now to get regeneratively sourced meat, grass fed, grass finished, ethically raised meat. I would never fault anyone for wanting to know where their meat comes from or being ethically concerned about, you know, animal agriculture. It's a really valid concern. And I think that there are good ways to do it now that support raising a cow well, that give a cow a good life. Um, and we all die, you know, we're all part of this circle of life and death. And I think that kind of like I alluded to earlier from an ethical perspective, we all have a gift. And I think our highest purpose is to manifest that gift the best we can. And if we believe that animal foods have unique nutrients, I believe that there's a strong argument to be made philosophically, ethically, that eating animals is the most ethical thing we can do for our children, for our future children, for our friends, for our family, for our partners, if it helps us show up the best way in the world and do the most good. That's, that's critical. And for ourselves, I mean, resilience, recovery from injury, fertility, this is what makes life worth living. And there's so much good evidence that avoiding meat and organs in the human diet leads to fragility and problems in all those things. We just become um, a less optimal version of ourselves. That's really tough. Greg and I order our meat from Force of Nature for the most them. part. Yeah. What would you recommend for people who maybe don't have access to an Irwan or a local farm? Mm -hmm. Where should they get high quality meat? Force of Nature is great. They do all the different animals. Um, I know the guy who runs it personally. He's a friend of mine, Robbie Sansom. And they source from Rome Ranch, part of their meat, which is a farm in Texas. 
Um, there's a great farm in Georgia, White Oak Pastures does good stuff. I'm trying to think of other farms. There's a farm outside of Austin called Shirttail Creek. Um, I should have this list, but I think if you just look online, there's all sorts of these regenerative farms popping up. And if people want to find raw milk, circling back to that, there's a website called realmilk.com, I believe. And that is actually a website. It's kind of like a Google map of where you can find raw milk in any city in the U.S. California is nice because raw milk is legal and it's sold in grocery stores. Here in L.A., you can get it at Sprouts. You can get it at Rainbow Acres. What is it mm-hmm. called? Rainbow, Rainbow Acres. Acres, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you can get it at Erewhon. And, but other places I go, like when I was in Arizona, I go to realmilk.com. I have to find the real the raw milk. Some states, it's illegal. I'm sorry, guys. You live in the wrong state. You should move. <laughs> um, but if you can't get raw milk where you are because it's illegal, Raw cheese is, is illegal almost everywhere. Okay. Yeah. And how about organs? I was telling you off mic, I've been on my organ journey. Yeah. I swallow a chunk of frozen liver every morning. You said you already had it today. I had it today. I feel amazing. And I will say I was telling uh, my friends that when I swallow it, it hits my throat and I just taste blood. <laughs> it's disgusting. But the benefits just outweigh it for me. It feels am- I just feel so much more energy and just it's this feeling of being alive. It sounds dramatic, but... It's true. Um, So what's interesting is I have a niece and a nephew. They're five and three. And what I've seen with kids is that if you give them liver early, they love it. It's like their favorite food. I've had friends and family or people that have contacted me on social media who give liver to their six-month-old. It's often a first food. It's a great first food. Again, sourcing matters. The quality of the sourcing is important. And if you give a child liver, they will kind of grow up with the taste and appreciate it. If you don't give a kid liver by the time they're two or three, they're just that they've had so many other things on their palate that are not like liver in any way, shape or form that it's going to be difficult and you have to undo it. I didn't like liver when I first tried it. I probably first had liver 10 years ago and I pretty much gagged. Right. And so it takes time and you can hide it in a smoothie. Um, I built a company called Heart and Soil, which makes desiccated organ capsules. And we're actually putting this desiccated organs in the smoothie I'm doing with Erewhon. No way. Yeah, yeah. It has the beef organs in the capsule. I'm really curious to see how people are going to react to this. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, come Friday. I'll come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. I'm excited to see how people react to it too. But so there are ways to get organs. So we, you know, with Heart and Soil, you can get organs in a desiccated capsule to start. And it's so funny is I was in, um, I was in San Diego and I met a woman there who said, um, I was at a rock gym and she just came up to me and said, uh, your stuff really helped me. I was a vegan. And the first thing I did was started taking the organ capsules from Heart and Soil to, to get the animal foods back in my diet. And that was really cool. And then she was able to kind of gradually incorporate the meat and stuff. So there are ways to get organs. And I hopefully will eat some liver. Maybe this is a good time to eat some liver on the show. Oh, I'm down. Let's 100%. do it. 100%. Should we, Should we get, get it? it? Um, Let's get the liver. I'll do it. I'll do it raw if I trust the source. You can do it frozen. Um, Are we eating it, it raw right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's probably not frozen. I don't think it's frozen, but we'll find out. So I'm going to really feel it. But the... But can we have the liver, please? But Thank if it's you. Not, if it's not frozen, it's actually easier because you can do a shooter. Um, so what with, do you mean? It's just going to slide down? Yeah, it just slides down. I re- that actually didn't help me mentally. <laughs> that actually made it worse. But I feel like the heart and soil pills are probably a great first step for yes. people who can't mentally like even look at it. I have some for you. They just didn't arrive. I'm gonna If you come to the Arrow One thing, I'm going to give you some because we have... Um, we have some really cool ones. So we have a, a capsule that's beef organs. So it's a bunch of the organs. But we have one for women that has ovaries and uterus and fallopian tubes. And that's kind of interesting. This office, the Bloom office, is 90% women. Uh-huh. So I would like to hand these out. Oh, yeah. Slash sneak them into people's food. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. that one is called Her Package. We have one for men that has testicle in it. Wow. And that one is probably our I've best eaten seller. testicle with Liver King, actually. Really? Not to flex, but... <laughs> That's a pretty good flex. Are you guys friends? Yeah, we're good friends. Okay, so I would regret not asking. Obviously, we're at the Bloom office. Uh-huh. We sell greens. <laughs> I think you know that. I'm not going to be offended. I just want to hear your take. So I think that, like I said, there are nutrients in plant foods, right? Um. I think, I don't know exactly what's in bloom. Um, my concern would be that some people are sensitive to certain leaves and yep. that can be problematic, right? And that if you don't have a problem with it, great. Um, yep. Combining bloom with hardened soil could be a lot of nutrients. You know? Oh, I love that response. You know, combining bloom with the capsules from hardened soil, you get a lot of great nutrients or combining bloom with liver or meat. That's great. Um, if you don't have a reaction to it, that's kind of how I feel about everything. Look. Like vegetables are not public enemy number one, in my opinion. I think that for people who are struggling and are really dialed in, can't quite figure things out, then they, they, 
they should look at vegetables and they should look at mushrooms and they should look at the nuance. But if you're really kicking ass and you're eating some kale every once in a while or you're eating some broccoli, like, like it's fine. It's not, gonna, yeah. it's not the worst thing in the world. I think seed oils are a big, like seed oils are probably public enemy number one. But if I had to rank them, it would, in my mind, it's like seed oils, processed food in general, which has a lot of fillers and carrageenan and gums and artificial colors, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors, like the, the artificial colors. Like, And what I'm learning more and more is that processed food adds a lot of things to the food, a lot of things to the food that are problematic. It just results in a bunch of excipients or which are binders and things like this, like silicon dioxide, which we know triggers inflammation in the gut, or it just, you get things like hexane or you get things like heavy metals like you're occurring in the foods when you process it too much. That's the main issue for people, the gums, the seed oils, like the, pro the, the things that get added to processed food. Right. For a lot of people, it's possible to eat vegetables from time to time or moderate amounts and not have issues. Yeah. But what I want people to know is if you have issues and they're not being solved, then then think about the vegetables and think about kale, think about spinach, which is high in oxalates. And people can follow my stuff if they really want to dig down into which are the, probably the biggest ones for people. But look, like if you want to, I think you can even ferment your vegetables and that makes them less problematic. So cabbage, for instance, that's a brassica. That's like in the same family as kale, which I'm not a huge fan of because it has a compound that inhibits iodine absorption level of thyroid. We know this from science. But if you ferment the cabbage and make sauerkraut, most of those are gone and you can get different flavor. I mean, people need variety and spice in their life. So Yeah. And the way I like to think of it also is kind of like a bridge to wellness. Yeah. When I started Bloom, it was because I was on the far end of the spectrum eating muffins every day, living a right. super unhealthy lifestyle. And I wanted something that would take me to that healthier lifestyle. And I think sometimes if you can have something that incorporates, you can incorporate every day and tastes good, it just takes you to that next level where you can start learning more about your body. I, I know a lot of people that eat significant amounts of vegetables and they're super healthy. You know, think about how you cook them. Obviously, think about organic and the pesticide residue on the vegetables. I think if I had to think about plant foods, vegetables is kind of this idea that it's it's the non-fruit part of a plant. I think grains are probably the most problematic thing for humans. The grains being the oats, the the wheat, that kind of stuff. And then probably nuts and seeds are also problematic for humans. So if you were going to get something out, think about those first. And then you, the leaves probably less problematic and then the roots some people have problems with white potatoes sweet potatoes probably not the worst thing in the world for some people but people react to all kinds of things but people also react to eggs in all fairness some people react to egg whites because of the albumin mm -hmm. so it's not you know it's not to say that animal foods are this some holy thing that doesn't cause problems for anyone i've had people who react to beef and i think okay you need to eat lamb it's just helping people navigate and understand that a lot of the foods we've been told are healthy seed oils things like this and even vegetables are not great for all people for someone who's listening who might be intimidated by an extreme lifestyle, like they're too intimidated to go full into carnivore, what is a key takeaway you hope they have from this conversation? I think that it's just that the first step in my mind is get rid of the processed foods. And that's been said so many times. I'm, I always struggle with how do you say that in a way that actually lands for someone? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's by describing the problems with the processed foods or what it does to them. Or, or I could just say something like, you know, I think getting rid of the processed foods will improve and potentially completely reverse so many of the chronic issues people have. And this is all kinds of things we didn't even talk about on this podcast. Like even mental health issues get better when people improve the quality of their diet, depression, anxiety, that's autoimmune too. That's neuroinflammation. So the, the spectrum is broad and there's so much hope for people who suffer from so many things and just getting rid of the processed foods means if you're just eating vegetables and fruit and meat, that's a great diet. That's a fantastic diet. Increase the dietary, the quality of the foods in your diet. That's the first step. And you will eliminate the seed oils. But it, just people have to understand that it's, that it is that, those ingredients in the seed oils and these little things sneaking into the processed foods that are problematic for them. So I think that's kind of the, the high level. Like you don't have to get that extreme about it. You don't have to cut out all those things. Um, you can, there's a lot of on-ramps. You mm -hmm. know, if you're, start with seed oils. Start with processed foods. Go from there. Start with eating more meat, not fearing meat. Yeah. Start with eating organs. Those three, th those four things alone will massively change someone's health and they'll be able to feel it. And I hope they'll get the feedback and think, wow, I do feel better. Even if it's a woman or a man who's fearing eating meat or bringing it back in their diet. You don't have to go full in. And there's the, the, the verbiage is a little complex for people, so I'll just clarify this. When I started doing this, I did carnivore, which was only meat and organs and fat for a year and a half. That actually didn't work well for me because of, the electrolyte issues that came with ketosis. I've tried to talk about this term called animal-based and the smoothie at Erewhon is called an animal-based smoothie, 
which is meant to be positioned in contradiction to plant based, so that you have some plants in your diet, but it's mostly animal based. So right. that's kind of the that's what I think of as fruit and you know raw milk and maybe even a sweet potato or something. That's like a little more in that sort of middle ground. Hopefully, there's something there that can uh, be an on ramp to someone. I'll need to have you on for a part two because I have questions about keto as well, but I'll save that yeah, for yeah, next yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Now it's time for the question we ask every guest. I started this po- this podcast because I believe everyone's pursuit of wellness looks different. What does wellness mean to you? It means getting up after having slept really well and feeling good um, and feeling happy and excited to do things in the world, whether it's interact with nature, um, spend time with friends, uh, you know, do, quote, work that brings value to people's lives. It's having the energy, the mental fortitude, the mental clarity, and the zeal and the enthusiasm to live life well and and do things that I find valuable. Fantastic. I love that answer. Where can people find you and Heart and Soil online? So Heart and Soil is at heartandsoil.co. And I am at at Paul Saladino, MD, like medical doctor everywhere on all the platforms. You used to be carnivore MD. I did. Why did you let that go? So we rebranded it because I wanted to be not as dogmatic. Right. You know, I have good friends here in Los Angeles and they, um, who are the minimalists, you know, the minimalists. Yeah. And they were saying, I think they, they, they thought that carnivore MD would turn people off. Right. It might scare people away before they get to know what you're right. actually talking right. about. Right. And mm-hmm. that was why I wanted to just add clarification to when you were saying carnivore, because I think when you say carnivore, probably your male audience goes, yeah, I want to be a carnivore. My 5%. And and the females go, I don't want to be a carnivore. Like, I don't want to be. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. I, I really prefer this approach. And I think people will actually get to hear the full story and get the full picture. Exactly. Because mm-hmm. I really think it benefits women as well. I mean, so Heart and Soil is, a, is an amazing group of people now. I'm so glad. I'm so proud of what we've done. They've they're in Austin. They're in, outside of Austin in Dripping Springs, and they've been doing a lot of film projects. And they did a film called Nourish. Did you see this one? No. It's on YouTube. So Hard and Soil has a YouTube channel, and it's all about sort of animal products and women's fertility, and it's incredible. Wow. There's a, a midwife on there, Lindsay Milas, who's actually here in uh, uh, L.A., and she. we have this scene in there where she um, looks at two different placentas, and one of them is from someone who's eating meat, and one of them is someone who's vegetarian, and it's the difference is really striking. Wow. And you, I hear this from midwives, and this isn't really my world, but um, I hear midwives say all the time that vegetarian placentas, especially vegan placentas, look like smokers' placentas. And I think this has got to hit women, you know, in the ovaries because, and men too, but especially women who want to conceive or have had kids, like that is very striking to me that animal foods shouldn't be feared it's just that it's just a healthier human when you're eating animal foods that's and, insane yeah and it, so there's a documentary on uh, on uh, youtube called nourished from hard and soil it's amazing they what's really your demographic it. split if you don't mind me asking you know it's changing which is really encouraging it used to be like 70 percent men and i think um my brand manager was just telling me it's like 60 percent men now so we've that's pretty so good it's like 60 so to have 40 percent women listening yeah. to me talk about meat and liver is incredible hmm. i think this will help as well i hope so there was one more thing I want to talk about. Hopefully we can sneak this in somewhere in the podcast because we were talking about linoleic acid accumulating. Yeah. And I, I think your audience of women will appreciate the fact that one of the things I worry about most with linoleic acid and seed oils is it accumulating in the skin. Oh. And so this goes back to sun fearing, right? And you think about what is in some, quote, healthy sunscreens contain seed oils. Yep. So just like you don't want to eat a seed oil, you don't want to put a seed oil on your skin. Like sunflower seed oil. Like sunflower seed oil. I've seen that oil. in a ton of products. Mm-hmm. And you can look at the ingredients of your face care products or your personal care products. And this is complex, but you can actually search the amount of linoleic acid in various oils. I think it's, I've, I'm actually building a skincare brand. So I was doing some research on this. I think it's argan oil is actually pretty high in linoleic acid. Wow. And that ends up in a lot of skincare. Carrot seed oil is very high in linoleic acid. Raspberry seed oil is very high in linoleic acid. A lot of times they're low on the list, but the goal is to create skincare with very little linoleic acid. Are you going to do beef tallow skincare? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. No beef way. Yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah. Have you seen the clip of Paul rubbing beef tallow on his face? Oh, yeah. It's iconic. Yeah. I feel like that blew up for you, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. People are... People were shocked. Yeah, and it's amazing. Do you I was, I was tempted. I'm just so scared. I'm so scared of messing my skin up. I get it. Like... I don't think it will. It's not really 
it doesn't really it's not really comedogenic though. let me try the raw dairy yeah i'll get back to you and then i'll try the beef you could put it on your skin you know beef tallow yeah on, like your arm or something yeah. or your shoulder hand moisturizer yeah it's definitely moisturizing for your hands i mean we're gonna mix it's not gonna be all tallow but it's gonna be tallow based because we like the animal fats yeah um and probably a little bit of mct oil in there too but just for texture um, because you want it to absorb right and that's tricky um, but the thing is that don't put seed oils on your skin and realize that if you're eating seed oils your skin is more susceptible to aging wow so that's what i really want women to know because i know that women think about that some men think about that but not as many like so you think about this face and this whole body that you have and if you're eating seed oils you are feeling every cell membrane in your body including your dermis and all of your epidermal everything facing the sun with seed oils and that's a problem and i think that um you know it's funny because i was talking to lauren and she has this book you know get the fuck out of the sun and i was like we have to talk about this but we didn't have a full conversation i think sun is valuable for humans in moderate doses and i don't want people to fear the sun right because of vitamin d and the nitric oxide and the endorphins there are things produced in the sun that are not produced when you take a vitamin d capsule and the light and the circadian rhythms we need sun on our face on our eyes and our skin all these things and um, I don't want women to fear that. And I think the way to make your skin resilient and healthy for as long as possible is to eat a very low linoleic acid diet because you think it's in every cell membrane in your body. And then, Love that. Yeah. So that's an important Thank piece. you for adding that. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I really wanted to make sure we put that in. That'll be great. I think it's a social clip too. That'll be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 